Well, hey, good morning, everybody. That ended very abruptly. It, it surprised me. My name is Tyrone, one of the pastors here, and just so glad to see you here this morning at Bell Road Church. We are starting today this Rooted series, as you saw from the video, and excited to go on this, this journey here. As you can tell from the video, we're, we're exploring lots of different questions, and so today the question is, who is God? Who is God? And many of us that have been already in Rooted Life Groups, we already have that workbook, that journal. We've been going through this whole week. We've been really wrestling with this already. Have you been enjoying the workbook? There's lots of cool studies in there and questions you're wrestling with. And so we've already been thinking about who, who is God. So we're going to look at this this morning. We're going to have some fun as we explore that question. By the way, let me just say it's good to see Pastor Thurman here with us this morning. Pastor Thurman, we're so glad you're here with us. Always welcome here. Hi, friend. Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> Lots of questions come up when you think about God, especially if you're new to faith or you're exploring that. Uh, you know, one of the famous questions about God is always, you know, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? You ever heard that one? Is that, is that possible for God, God to do? Well, as we explore who is God, the question that I kept going back to is, is really this question of how do we know that God is even real? You ever wrestled with that before? Yeah. How do I even know that He's real. How do I know that he exists? I mean, do you, do you really believe that he's real, that he exists? Uh, have, have you seen him? Can you prove it? Like, if I handed you the mic right now and said, hey, tell, tell everyone right now, prove to us that God is real and he exists, what would you say? <laughs> okay. And hopefully uh, that's a good start. Okay, he's real. Okay, because this is what I've seen. And so we're going to explore this, this topic here this morning of is he real? How do I know he's real? I think it's important for you and I to have an answer, by the way. If someone's going to ask you, prove to me that God's real. And hopefully someday you have an opportunity to, to have that kind of a conversation. In fact, the Bible says that we need to be ready for those conversations. 1 Peter 3, 15. I love this verse. It'll be the first one we hit here this morning. It says this. 1 Peter 3, verse 15 says, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Make sure as you have those discussions, you talk with people, do it with gentleness and respect. Okay, so if you're one of those people that's already set apart in your, in your heart Christ as Lord, as it, as it says there in the beginning, then it says this, you need to be ready when people ask you, to give a reason for the hope that you have. And there is hope always in Jesus, because of Jesus. There's always hope. But if someone asks you, what are you going to say? Why do you have a hope in him? What's your reasoning? How do you, how, prove to me that God is real. So we've got to be ready for questions like that. And in fact, when I read this verse, uh, an important question for us to ask ourselves is, is anybody even asking me? Because this verse almost assumes that people are going to ask you. It says, be prepared when someone asks you. So, if no one's asking me, maybe people don't really know that I'm a follower of Jesus, that I believe this. So that's a good question to ask myself. Is anyone asking? And then when they do, you need to be ready. You need to be ready because we want to show people that you can have hope in Jesus. So as you wrestle with this whole thing of like, is God real? Does he exist? You know, one of the other questions that I've wrestled with, maybe you've wrestled with before, that you kind of go to in this whole conversation is, well, what about evolution and creationism? You know, what, how, how do you reconcile those two things? Because it kind of comes down to that. You know, if, if evolution's real, then we don't even need to think about God. It doesn't even matter if God's real. But if creation is real, then that is an important question. How, how do I know that God is real? How can I prove him? And so there's that big debate. And many people, many smart people talk about both sides, wrestle with both sides. I'll never forget the first time I heard and really began to learn about evolution. I was in the sixth grade. And I was in Mr. Zuber's class. Remember Mr. Zuber, Mom? My mom's here with us this morning. So you remember Mr. Zuber? Love Mr. Zuber. Yes, thank you. You can give my mom a hand. I owe a lot to her. Pretty much everything. Uh, so I was in Mr. Zuber's class. Loved, great sixth grade teacher for me. But I remember learning in science about this evolution thing. Like we evolved over millions of years. And it, and it just it confused me because I'd grown up in the church. And I'm one of those... People, maybe you, you, you can identify with this. You grew up in the church. And I'm thankful that I grew up in the church. Very thankful. Uh, but I'm here in evolution, and I'm, I'm thinking, this isn't what I've been taught all my life. 
Like, I've been taught, like, God created everything. Like, he spoke, and it all existed, and he created all of life and, and, and humans. So we've evolved over millions of years. It just was, it was weird. It was confusing to me, and it was, you know, you have a crisis of faith almost. Like, how do you reconcile the two? So you think about it, though, that whole debate or discussion comes down to this. If evolution is true, then we're all here by accident, and there's no purpose to life. There's really no meaning behind this life. And so it doesn't matter how you live. Just live however you want because life's an accident. and doesn't, you just, just live your life and then you're done. You're gone. But if we're here as a product of creation, then life has purpose and it has meaning. And so it really comes down to that. Is really, is there a meaning? Is there a purpose to my life or is, am I just an accident? That's really what those two worldviews would give us, right? Now, again, there's smart people on every side of this. Here's what Bill Nye, the science guy, has to say uh, about creationism. And I love Bill Nye, but here's what he has to say about creationism. He's obviously a proponent of evolution. He says, creationism in the U.S. is an embarrassment and a shame, a religious superstition that does real harm to children. Creationism is a symptom of a willful ignorance and an anti-intellectualism that thwarts scientific progress at home and humiliates the U.S. abroad. Bill Nye, the science guy. Now, I love Bill Nye. I remember watching his show back in the day. Here's why I love about Bill Nye. He could take something totally uninteresting and boring and make it cool. Did you ever notice that? I'd get sucked into his show, even in college. I'm like, I don't even care about this subject, but he's making it interesting. And so I'm watching. So I always, I always gave Bill Nye props for that. Okay, smart guy, brilliant guy. People really respect him, but he, he does not think that creationism is a valuable thought or belief. And, you know, there's, uh, you know, a lot of atheists out there that, you know, aren't anti-religion, but then there's some that are. Some that just came to the conclusion, I just don't think that there is a God, so I'm just going to live atheist. And there's other people like this that are like, I'm going to attack religion, and I'm going to, in the name of intellectualism, I'm going to put down anyone else who doesn't believe the way that I believe. Is really what they're saying. And so it can be tough for us as we wrestle with this whole, like, how can I even explore this when people would say, well, if you really think like that, then, then you're an idiot because this is embarrassing. I think it's important to have open, honest discussions about this stuff and to, de and to debate this stuff. So I, I don't believe what Bill Nye believes. I believe that there is a God. And I really believe that there are clues to the existence of God. So that's why I want to take a few moments here this morning. Is I want to give you some clues to why I believe that God exists. So the approach that I'm taking this morning is this. It's kind of an apologetic approach. Instead of, a, instead of opening up the Bible and, and, and seeing what the Bible has to say about God, this is who God is, which is a fascinating, powerful, and profound study. As you study who God is, his characteristics, his, his names, all that stuff, it's an amazing, life-changing study. Uh, but I decided not to go that approach. Many of us do our, our life group workbooks, that rooted workbook. We've already been studying some scriptures and talking about and looking about God and thinking about God. And switch, by the way, if you haven't dove into a life group, it is still not too late. Dive into one. You will, you will grow. It will be highly beneficial for you to dive in. Because, as you can tell, we are going to be spending every Sunday morning looking at the topic that we're studying. So you'll get so much more out of our Sunday morning topics because you've already been studying it all week. But uh, I decided not to take the, the, you know, the Bible approach of who God is. I wanted to take the, the apologetic approach is what I was saying. And apologetics, if you don't know what that is, it doesn't mean it's like we apologize for believing in God. It's not apologetics. It actually means I, I, it's a defending of the faith. I want to give reasons for the faith. That's what apologetics is. Is my voice sounding okay out there, by the way? It's okay? Okay, good. It sounds really ringy to me, but maybe it's just me. All right, I just want to make sure. All right, here we go. Six clues for the existence of God. You ready? If someone's going to ask you to give a reason for the hope that you have, I want to give you some conversation starters right here. If you're here this morning and you're just really exploring this whole Christianity thing and this is all new to you, this is a great Sunday for you to be here because it may, may help you as you really process, is God real? So listen to these clues here. Clue number one for the existence of God is the universe. The existence of the universe really raises the question, how on earth did the universe get here? Like, why is that even here? If... If nothing existed, then we wouldn't have to explain it, right? 
But since something exists, and now that something does exist, then that necessitates an explanation. You know, there's this argument of necessity that I, I've always loved. And the argument of necessity is this, is in order for something to exist, something has to have always existed. It's the argument of necessity. In order for something to exist, something else has to have already always have existed. There's that necessity for that. Uh, G.W. Leibniz, I don't know how to say this dude's name. Leibniz, 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 whatever it is. Okay. Smart guy, because this is a great quote, all right? The first question which should rightly be asked is this. Why is there something rather than nothing? So think about the universe. There's a universe out there. It's amazing. It's huge. It's, it's vast. There's this really cool website. I thought about showing you, but I'd encourage you to write down this website. And uh, you can look at it later, maybe later on this afternoon. It's called scaleofuniverse.com. Okay? Scaleofuniverse.com. Dot com. And you can go on there and you can click on this picture and you can like, as a picture of a man and all these other animals and it's the, it's the size of us in comparison to plants and animals and all that kind of stuff. And you, you scroll to the right and it zooms out and it goes into the bigger things, you know, the mountains and the continents and the earth and it goes out to the, all the planets, the solar system, Milky Way. It just, you just keep going, you keep going, you keep going, you keep going. You're like, wow, there's a lot out there. And you scroll to the left and it goes all the way back and you come back to to the spot where it's, there's man again and he goes inside to you know, our cells and our DNA and it goes deep inside like to inner space. It's a fascinating website. There's really cool stuff there. I'd encourage you to, to, to check it out. But it just shows you just the vastness of the universe and all that exists out there in the universe, even, way out there and even in here. I've got some pictures of, of the universe here. Found some of these this week. I, I love these pictures. I mean, here's one from the forest. I mean, look at that. I believe that's the Milky Way. It's just beautiful. It's amazing. Okay, there's another one here from, from the desert. This perhaps is Utah or Arizona here. I mean, you just, you, you're, when you're out in nature like that and you look out, don't you just think to yourself, wow, that is beautiful. I mean, it doesn't matter what anybody believes. Everyone enjoys beauty like that. Okay, and the next one. Uh, there's someone standing this. I know for sure that is the Milky Way. Someone just took a cool picture there uh, one night. Milky Way right there. And then you got one more here. And this one shows the whole universe. And this one makes you feel really, really small. Look, there you are, somewhere inside that little yellow circle, in this vast, this vast expanse of the universe. There you are right there in this little building right in the middle of Phoenix. Can you see yourself? No, because the universe is huge. It's massive. So you think about the universe. How did that all get there? How did it come to be? Can something come from nothing? My friends, that takes a lot of faith. Both views take, take faith. Okay, let's be real. You know, someone say, well, how do you know? I mean, how do you know God is real? Well, so if... if, if all this exists, that's right, you know, and God made it, but where did God come from? Okay, I don't know, but he, it appears that he was always here. He's always here. That's why I love Genesis 1.1. You go to Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God. The first four words are very important for the Bible. Did you know that? Okay, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and everything, and so we're looking at this picture right here. In the beginning, God created all of this. And you look at that, and you're like, man, God you're pretty cool. No, 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 actually, you're really cool and amazing, and that's just awesome. And so you can't really answer the question of, like, where did God come from? But you also can't answer the question of, well, how did something come from nothing? It makes more sense, I believe, it makes more sense that something came from something. Yeah. I think it takes more faith to believe that something came from nothing, by the way. That's my personal opinion when you really think about this. I love this quote that, that we read this week in our Rooted workbook, and I wanted to read this because it, it looks at Genesis 1.1. And where's the quote at? Oh, here it is. The first four words of the Bible are more than an introduction to the creation story or the book of Genesis. They supply the key which opens our understanding to the Bible as a whole. They tell us that the religion of the Bible is a religion of the initiative of God. You can never take God by surprise. You can never anticipate him. He always makes the first move. He's always there in the beginning. 
Before we existed, God acted. Before man stirs himself to seek God, God sought man. In the Bible, we do not see man groping after God. We see God reaching after man. So we see a God who created all this, who initiated all of this. Okay? I love Psalm 19. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. When you look at the universe, that's what comes to my mind is Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. Of God. He goes on to say this, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. Psalm 19 is basically God saying, hey, look at all I've created. I'm just saying this. I'm here. I'm showing you that I'm real by what I have created created. I'm here. I exist. Which is why in Romans 1.20, we, we see this verse here. It says this, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. And so when you really ponder at life, you think about life, you look at the universe, and it was, it's made. It's God saying, hey, I am clearly seen because of all that has been made. I am here. I am in this. I think the universe and the fact that it exists is a major clue that there is a God. Amen. Number two is life, life itself. It's the fact that we're alive, like we're here, I believe is another clue that God is real. I mean, think about life. How, how, do, how is it that, that life exists? How is it that we are even here? That's a similar thing. Can, can life come from something that's not alive? Is that even possible? Can we evolve into these beings that we are right now as detailed and as intricate as our bodies are? I mean, think about how, how incredibly detailed your body is. Can, can two sexes evolve from nothing? I mean, you think about how we, have, we are two sexes, and the sexes can come together, and they can procreate more life. We can create life ourselves. Does that happen by accident? Uh, you know, you think about those things, like, how could that just all of a sudden happen? How could nature create two sexes to procreate? My friends, that takes a whole lot of faith. Or could it be that we were created this way, that we were designed this way? You know, there's a saying that says, every design reflects a designer. You look at anything designed. Maybe you've been staring at my Pepsi can up here this whole time. I like Pepsi. Uh, I've said for years that I owe my life to Jesus and Pepsi. Because Jesus, you know, he saved me, redeemed me, man. He's given me hope, future. Uh, man, I love Jesus and what he did for me on the cross. I can never repay him. I want to live for him. So I owe my life to Jesus, but I also owe my life to, to Pepsi because... For over 40 years, my father has worked for Pepsi. And so growing up, uh, Pepsi supported my family, okay? So I had a roof over my head and a bed in large part because of Pepsi. All right, anyways. So you may look at this can. This is a big one here. This is like the Super Bowl can right here. It says, um, saddle up for Super Bowl, which we don't care about Super Bowl now because, you know, Seahawks aren't in the Super Bowl, so... <laughs> You may look at this can, though, and you think, man, isn't it amazing how that just all came together like that? Like, this aluminum all of a sudden came around all this liquid and formed in this beautiful color. And there's this little device that happened to fall upon the top where I can, excuse me, open it with. And you see the fizz and the bubble. Like, inside there's this liquid that just tastes absolutely perfect <laughs> and it burns when it goes down meaning it feels good I love that hmm. I love Pepsi it tastes so good but you think isn't it amazing how that all came together like that perfectly all that that liquid inside you know it's full of sugar and other flavoring and more sugar. I don't know what it is, you know. It's really good for us, though. You would look at this and you'd say, 
somebody obviously made that, right? Because every design reflects a designer. And you look at the world and, and even our life and, and who we are, there's an incredible design to our bodies, which reflects a designer. This British philosopher, Dr. Anthony Flew, he, he said this, and he's been a leading spokesman for atheism. He's been in debates for years and years and years as a devout atheist, but all the scientific research that continues to happen, especially in regards to DNA, has caused him to really rethink the origin of the species. And so he said this in an interview, it's on, it's on a video, he says, superintelligence is the only good explanation for the origin of life and the complexity of nature. There's a lot of people that come to that viewpoint scientifically. They don't want to, but they look at everything and the complexity of it, like he says here in the design, like, oh, I can't really explain that. There has to be design. There has to be some sort of intelligent design to all this. And, and for him, the biggest proponent was the discovery of DNA and, and all that we continue to learn about DNA and how amazing that is. So science is teaching us and showing us there has to be a designer. And a lot of scientists, they may not say they believe in God, but some of them are shifting over to like, oh, there's got to be something that made this. That's why we can go back to Genesis 1 and say, yeah, we know who made this. In the beginning, God. He created the heavens and the earth. He created all of life, and he created you and me. He created us, and we are created in his image. We are image bearers of God. So we can trust those words as we look at the amazing design of our life that there is a designer and he is God. And he is not just a God that's up there. He's a personal God who wants to know you and I and have relationship with us. We'll talk about that in a moment. But number three, the number three clue is our senses of morality. We all have a sense of morality, right? Did you know that? Everybody has morals. Not that we always fully obey our morals, but we all got them, don't we? I mean, you remember when you were a kid and maybe you, you told some lies? Maybe it's a big lie, a little lie. Maybe you, uh, you stole something. Maybe you cheated. Remember cheating on tests back in the day just so I could get a good grade? All right, don't tell my mom. But you think back to, you think back to things you did as a kid, and even when you did those things, you, you're like, I know it's not right, but you did it, right? You still did it. You just you wanted to do it. You just, you had to, for whatever reason, you convinced yourself it was okay. But we all have this sense of morality. And you think about every culture, uh, every people that group that's ever existed, they all have this sense of it's wrong to kill people. That's not right. And so there's a sense of morality. So you look at the sense of morality that everybody has within them, and you would say, does that come because we're a product of evolution, or does it become because we're a product of design? See, if we're a product of evolution, it doesn't matter. There is no set of morals. There's no right or wrong. Everything is accidental. You know, just live life to the fullest. Do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Survival of the fittest. You could deem yourself the fittest, and other people aren't, which is what the Germans were trying to do way back in the day. They thought themselves as better than anybody else, and so survival of the fittest means it doesn't matter because there's lesser people and there's better people, and, it's, and there's no morals, and who cares? I'll just make up my own morals. I don't care what yours are. So there's got to be a basis of morality since we all have this sense of morality. And that's where we find that from God who created us and we look to his word for the basis of morality. Okay? But just the fact that there is morality, that's another clue. Number four is relationships. The fact that we're so relational, yeah. this kind of gives clue that there's meaning and purpose to life. We all Love to enjoy relationships. You think about life, everything revolves around relationships, okay? We like to share life together, and I would say we need to share life together. You ever notice how, like, when you, when you laugh at a funny joke, you're like, ha, 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 what do you do? You look around the room. Maybe it's the next person next to you, and you're like, ha, 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 you know? As soon as you catch eyes, you keep laughing even more. Have you noticed how you do that? Okay? It's funny. Next time, you, you're going to catch yourself doing this. You're laughing. Ah, ha, 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 yeah, you know. What happened right there is you just shared a moment. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's true. And it speaks to relationship, doesn't it? Oh, that's so funny. I don't want to just laugh on my own. I want to share that moment with somebody. I'll look around, caught eyes. Oh, awesome. We just shared a moment together. And it, that moment was even better because we shared that moment. Right? It's true. It speaks to relationship. Okay? We all want relationship. We're driven by this desire to share life with people. And I think that it, that never comes out more than when you're at a funeral or memorial service of a loved one. 
You feel the loss of relationship, right? Well, the Bible tells us that God created us because he wanted relationship with us. He wanted to know us and be close to us. And in the beginning, it was perfect, just as God wanted it. But unfortunately, we broke that relationship. Sin entered the world, Genesis 3, through Adam and Eve. And because of that, now we have all this pain, this heartache, brokenness, sin, death, disease. All came, all came in, that all happened because of, because of sin. So we broke that relationship. But God still being the initiator of that relationship, because remember, he created us to have relationship with him, ultimately. That's why you were born, is to have relationship with your creator. But he, we broke it, and so he still wants to initiate that relationship. I mean, he could have left us on our own and say, hey, you guys screwed this up, man. Sorry. You lose. But because of his intense love for us, he says, I'm going to still initiate relationship, and I'm going to solve this dilemma and this issue. So what does God do? He enters our world, becomes one of us, shows us who he is, what he is like, lives his perfect life, and then he goes to the cross and dies for us because the Bible tells us that because we've sinned, we, we deserve to die. And so God says, I'm going to take your place so you don't have to. Because he wants to initiate relationship. He wants to solve that relational issue that we have with, with him. You think about it. He did not have to do that, did he? But he wanted to. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before we could ever respond to what he did for us. Before we could ever decide. It's an amazing thing is that God decided he loved you before you even had a chance to decide. That's why he went to the cross for you. And so we have an opportunity to respond to his solution for that broken relationship. And if you would have asked Jesus for forgiveness for your sins and accept what he did for you on the cross, then you can have a relationship with your creator. Maybe today some of you need to do that. Because again, you were born, designed for your relationship with your creator. So that's number four. Number five, I think this is perhaps the most profound clue that there is a God, and it is Jesus himself, who I just talked about. Okay, Jesus lived. He lived on the earth, and he had all these great teachings, and, and the, the difference between Jesus and all the other founders of religion is Jesus claimed to be God himself. No one else did. But Jesus says, I'm God. The only way you get to heaven is through me. And so people struggle with the exclusive nature of Jesus' teachings. Like, you're the only way? Uh, you know, they wrestle with that. And so you look at Jesus' teachings and his claims, you come to the conclusion either uh, two things. Either it's true or it's not true, right? It has to be one of those two things. It's either true or it's not true. If it's true, then Jesus really is God and he is Lord. But if it's not true... If you made it all up, then it's, you, know, you can come to two other conclusions. Either he lied, and he knew he was lying, he intentionally lied, or he was just a lunatic. Okay? He was a crazy man that actually believed he was God, but he really wasn't. Maybe he was mental or something. Okay? So those are the really only the three conclusions you can draw of Jesus. He was either Lord, or he was a liar, or he was a lunatic. But in order for us to really figure out which one of those three he is, you have to look at one thing. And that one thing is the most significant event in human history. And that's the resurrection. Yeah, come on. Everything about Christianity centers around the resurrection. Because if that didn't happen, this is all worthless and meaningless. This doesn't even matter. This is all made up. We might as well just go home and watch football. Like right now, some of you are thinking, yeah, awesome, Tyron. Let's do it right now. Let's go. And, you know. But hey, if it is real, then this matters. This is, a big, this is more important than football or anything else in life. It's all about the resurrection. Paul recognized that. He says that in 1 Corinthians 15, 14. He says, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. It's all about the resurrection. If he did not rise from the dead, this is all a hoax. So we know that Jesus did live. That's historical fact. We actually know that he died on a cross. Historical fact. The question is, did he rise from the dead? Because if he didn't, then this is made up, but if he did, that changes everything. And everything about Christianity is real, and it matters. And everything about this book is real, and this is truth, and it matters. And so I tell people, if you can prove that Jesus did not rise from the dead, then let me know. There is all, honestly, an overwhelming evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. 
overwhelming. People set out to try to disprove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And many of them come to the conclusion, I have to believe. This is amazing. I never, wow. Jesus, I believe, is the greatest example that God is real. So the last one is this. So we bring it home. Personal experience is another great clue that there is a God. For those of you following God, you've undoubtedly have some, had an experience with God. You've encountered him. It was, you're, you're probably serving God because of an initial experience with God, right? Uh, your, your experience with God is a powerful message that you have in telling other people about the existence of God. And I've had so many encounters with God throughout my life. It's, it's even hard to just go on and on explaining them and, and talking about them. Amazing things that God has done and spoken to me. And some of them are pretty cool. If I were to take time this morning to share them with you, you'd be like, wow. That had to be God because I know you, Tyrone, and you're not that smart. So that had to be God. <laughs> and it's true. It had to be God. When I think back to the initial moment that I really surrendered my life to Jesus, and it was in a season of my life where I, 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 I still believed in God, but I didn't really want to have anything to do with him. You ever been there? <laughs> I, don't, I don't deny that you exist, God, but I'm just going to live life my way. And I had, you know, struggled for, you know, a couple of years with my faith. And it was my, my eighth grade, ninth grade year. And somewhere in my, my sophomore year in high school, I, I found myself in a setting like this. And I just had this overwhelming sense of the presence of God. He was so real. He was so tangible. It was one of those things, I, God, I can't ignore you anymore. God, you, you matter. I, I need to stop running from you. I just need to live for you. And in that moment, I surrendered my life to, to Jesus completely, and I've never looked back since, ever. And some people would say, well, you know, you really wanted to have that experience. So you kind of made it up. It's kind of this made-up religious experience. Well, I'd say, I, I don't think so. Because at that time in my life, like, I, yes, I was still kind of open to God, but I didn't really want to have anything to do with him. And so for me, it was like this, I had to. Like, there's, there's no other option or alternative for me. Like, if I go my, my direction in life, I don't even want to think where that's going to take me. God, I want to follow you and live for you because you matter. You know, there's lots of people throughout history that have kind of had similar experiences. C.S. Lewis being one of them. You know, if you study C.S. Lewis, who was, who was a devout atheist, uh, he became a Christian. And when he converted to Christianity, he called himself this. This is in his words. He says, when he finally realized, I, I can't ignore this anymore, I studied all this, I've wrestled with this, he says, I was the most dejected, reluctant convert in all of England. <laughs> because he's like, I just have to do this. I, you know, and if, if you've all your life not wanted to do something and then you realize you need to, you, so, you, you feel that, right? Like, oh, I can't stop going against you, God, and talking. You're real. And so he reluctantly gave his life to God. And then the rest was history. As the Spirit of God entered his life and began to change him. And it's just amazing what, what God did in his life. So your personal experience with God is a, an important clue that God is real. Yeah. Let me just say this. The enemy will try to convince you that your experiences with God aren't real. You made it up. Are you sure? Oh, that's, that, that didn't happen. You just was over, you know, over emotional about something. No, no, the enemy will try to convince you otherwise. But those experiences... They happen. They're real. And then, let me just say this from my heart here. To bring this to a close here this morning. Some of you, maybe you resist God and don't want to experience God because of your experiences with Christians. And can I say open up your heart to God in spite of maybe how Christians have treated you? We've all been hurt by people. I've been hurt by people. You've been hurt. You know. And the truth is we've all hurt other people. But I, I, don't, I don't want you and your experiences with God to be dictated or determined by how other people have treated you. So look to him. Open your heart to him. Maybe you can experience him for the first time in a real, true, genuine way. So those are just six clues that I, why I believe God exists. I think those are really, really big clues, by the way. Huge. And when you think about them, this is what happens to me. I just step back, especially when I think back to the, you know, the universe and 
the scope of the universe. Put that, put that picture up again of the whole universe in that little circle where we're at. When I, see, when I see things like this, I just think, wow, God, you are absolutely incredible. And the word that comes to my mind is awe. God, I am so in awe of who you are and everything that you've made. I really can't shake that word awe. Last week, we were reading Acts chapter 2, and the early church, the first church, the early Christians, they were in awe of God. All week long as I've been studying God, I've just had this resounding, like this feeling of just awe. I just can't shake it. I just want to have a, a greater, fresher, newer, clearer understanding of who God is. And the more I seek him, the more in awe of him I am. And it happened to me several times over this last week where I just had to stop. One time I just laid on the ground and I just said, God, I am so in awe. God, you are so incredible. What does awe mean? It's a fun word to say, by the way, awe. You know, your dentist makes you say it. That's a different awe. Awe. If you're from Australia, you say ar. That's how they say that. You ever notice that? Listen to Hillsong. When they say, I stand in awe of God, they stand in awe of God. It's, it's awesome. The definition of, of awe, according to Webster, is mingled dread, veneration, and wonder. Also, these, these words are contained in the meaning of awe. Honor, fear, respect, and again, wonder. I love that. The wonder, the fear, the respect. It's the awe of who God is. You know, my hope is for us is that awe wouldn't be just a feeling we feel every once in a while, but it would be this, this constant state that we live in of who God is. Are you in awe of God when you think about the universe and all that he made? Does that cause you to go, wow, man, God, you are amazing. When you think about life and how complex and incredible you've been designed, does that cause you to say, wow. I mean, even Darwin himself, did you know that? The, the, the eyeball messed with him. He thought, if we're, you know, origin of the species, you know, the evolution, all that stuff, but the complexity of the eyeball, it just, it messed with Darwin. He couldn't explain it. It troubled him because of the amazing design of even just your little eyeball. Man, doesn't that just make you say, God, you are amazing. Wow. You gave us life. We get to enjoy relationship with people in life. It gets tough sometimes, but for the most part, man, life, life is good. It's pretty awesome. What a privilege it is that we get to enjoy another day today of life, right? That you're here today. You're alive. You're sucking air. You're alive. Aren't you in awe of that? you awe of God and how he wants to be close to us. Remember, God wants a relationship with us. We broke it, but God resolved that issue on the cross. He died on the cross so that we could have relationship. We could restore that. If we believe in what he did on the cross, it's restored, okay? Uh, but here's the, here's the rest of the story. The, the good news is Jesus rose from the dead. He didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead, proving that he was God. He is who he said he was. He ascended up into heaven, and then even better news is he's coming back. He's coming back, okay? He's coming back someday. He's going to restore his kingdom. It's his eternal kingdom. It's going to last forever. We get to enjoy that with him forever. And so that's this amazing hope that we have because of God. There's purpose. There's meaning behind all of this. When I think about that and I think about forever with God, man, I just stand in awe of who he is. Hebrews 12, last verse. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Man, when we're in awe of God, uh, it's easy to worship God. You come to church and you're already thinking God's awesome. You're like, oh, man, I love worshiping you, God. It's been time. If you come to, to, to church and you're, and you're like, you're struggling, uh, you know, the situations, the pressures of life, you're stressing you out, it's tough, right? Because the awe is gone. It's amazing how life can squeeze the awe right out of us. Really, we're awe of other stuff going on and we've lost our awe of God. I was really thinking about this this week, this awe. And I thought, you know, God doesn't need us to be in awe of him. We need us to be in awe of him. <laughs> our, our awe of God doesn't change who God is. In fact, you ever thought about this? Nothing about our response changes anything about God. 
People don't believe in God, people believe in God. That doesn't change who he is. God is still God regardless of what we believe. So he doesn't even really need us to be in awe of him because he's still God. He's still amazing. He still created all this stuff. But we need us to be in awe of him. My response to God never changes who he is because his kingdom is unshakable. That's what we just read there. It's, it's unshakable. It cannot be shaken. He cannot be shaken because he is God and Lord of all. And when I have an awe of God, he's not changed I am. Do you have a wonder of him, an awe of him, or have you lost it? Why don't you stand to your feet and let's, let's close here. I took a few extra moments. Thanks for sticking with me. But I really want to end on this as I think about all this stuff. I really wanted to end with the, God, you are amazing and awesome. Go ahead and close your eyes right now and just begin to think about your life. Like you're alive. Here you are. Why are you even here? Why do you exist? What are you doing? Where are you going with life? What's really important? What really matters? Can I just say, what really matters right now is you and I just look into God. We look into him. And just take a few moments right now and you're, while you're standing there, eyes closed, just begin to thank God. Begin to thank him for all that he's done, who he is. Think about how amazing he is, what he created. Out of the seven billion people on earth right now, God sees you. He hears you. That's how incredible and amazing he is. And he cares. He cares. Come on, would you let God capture your imagination, capture your wonder, capture your awe again? Maybe you've lost that awe. our hearts and our minds, I pray right now, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We're going to take a few moments here, pray and worship and have some communion, which is a chance for us to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. But with your eyes closed right now, before we go any further, just eyes closed just for a moment before we go. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Tyrone, I've lost the all. I man, I want to live in this place. I just am in awe of who God is. Just lift your hands up right now. And I want to pray for you today. So give me this awe of who you are, God. Come on, right now. Just, just, this is just being real and honest. No judgment here. This is just, this is where I'm at right now. It's, I just need to be in awe of who God is. Put your hands down. If anyone else is here, maybe you're saying, I, I really need to begin a relationship with God. I recognize he's real and he's, he's really speaking to me and stirring in me right now. I need to give my life to him. If that's you here this morning, man, I'd love for you just to raise your hand because I want to pray for you as well. Anybody here this morning that would say, today, Tyrone, is my day to give my life to God. Just slip your hand up. I want to pray for you. Maybe you're, you need to rededicate and give your life back to God or maybe it's, this is the first time. I need him. Anybody here this morning? Thank you. Anybody else? Hey, why don't we all take a moment and just pray? Let's, we're all going to just kind of pray along with me. You don't have to repeat, but let's just all pray this prayer. It's kind of a prayer that's good for all of us, but especially for those that are really committing their life to God. It's a prayer of repentance and, and forgiveness. So, God, right now, we just come to you in humility, recognizing that you are God and I am not. I just thank you for your overwhelming love for me, and I, I just ask that you would forgive me for my sins for rebelling against you and doing my own thing. And I accept that you are real and that you died on the cross for my sins. So please forgive me. Come into my life. Lead me, fill me for the rest of my life that I may live life with you and spend eternity also with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you join me in prayer right now? Lord, we look to you in awe and amazement and wonder at how incredible you are. But we can't even comprehend who you are. Lord, you are so much greater and so much bigger. You're so far beyond us, Lord, that we can't even understand your vastness 
and your greatness. So because of that, God, we're just in awe of who you are. Lord, I pray that we'd be people who live in that place, Lord, constantly in awe and amazed and in wonder. Lord, capture our hearts and our imagination, I pray, God. We may never forget how amazing, incredible, and loving that you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.